Good evening. Welcome to Asheville City School Board of Education regular board meeting for tonight, Monday, May 15th, 2023. Um, it's an exciting night for this district, and so I'm so excited to see a full room. Um, for those of you who are um, online, we're excited that you're joining us online. Uh, for those of you who are not able to join us, we hope you'll get a chance to watch this at some point. Um, it's a really exciting night. Um, so I do want to call this meeting to order. We do have a quorum, and um, we will start tonight with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance from Ms. Bruder's second grade class from Isaac Dixon Elementary. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I mean, it, it's a celebratory night, so. Yeah. I told you not to do that. <laughs> um, I would like to ask for a motion to approve tonight's agenda, which includes um, the introduction of our new superintendent. So moved. It's been moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So it is approved, and we will start. Um, I know we're anxious to meet the next superintendent of Asheville City Schools, but also we are a district committed to our educators and our children, and so we are starting tonight, as we should, with good news. So April, thank you so much. Thank you, board chair, interim superintendent Dr. Cosby, and board members for coming tonight and sharing with you our May section of good news. We'll get right started real quick. Um, the other night, we got to celebrate Lizzie Rogers. She was named the 2024 Teacher of the Year, and she is with us tonight. Yep, tonight. Lizzie and I came in the district at about the same time and she's taught my children, so I'm personally forever grateful for all of her hard work. She was selected by a, a committee who reviewed and did an interview process and she was also selected as the Teacher of the Year for Asheville High School by her peers, which is an amazing honor. And we are so very proud of her and her many years of service. If I remember correctly, Ms. Rogers, it's been 20, 2002? One. One, 2001. So thank you so much. <laughs> Ms. Rogers also serves as um, she announces our ball games, and she's fr trying to frantically get away to get to the state playoff game. But if you don't mind, take a quick picture. <laughs> she wears many hats, many hats. At this time, I'm going to ask Julia Young to please come up and join me. The National Honor Society seniors received their cords and signed the 100-year-old scroll last week. New members were also inducted to the National Junior Honor Society. Tonight, I have Asheville High School senior Julia Young, and she's going to tell you more about the National Junior Honor Society. Or Honor Society. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Young, and I'm the president of National Honor Society. Today we wanted to recognize our new members as well as our seniors graduating with honors after refilling the requirements of NHS. They have excelled academically, been strong models of character and leadership in our community, and have committed themselves to service in the community at large. National Honor Society is dedicated by its four key values, scholarship, service, leadership, and character. Our graduates have upheld these values and completed the required service hours, which means they will graduate with honors. We have over 2,000 service hours this year, 
a total of 102 new members and 65 seniors graduating with honors. So very good news. Thank you. We also want to take a moment and honor all of our hard work and middle school students who participated in the Do, right, Do the Right Thing essay contest. The Do the Right Thing is a writing program organized by the National Campaign to Stop Violence. It's for middle school students for, to examine the root causes and impact of youth violence and offer a solution through their writing. Two student essays were chosen to put in the Library of Congress. The students, their teacher, and a family member will get to go to Washington, D.C. for this historic event. Last week, we recognize and honor all of our finalists, and the Asheville City Schools winner is Asheville Middle School student Ace Wilkins, and Ace is here with us tonight. Um, hi. Um. <laughs> I have never spoken to this many people before. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Ace, and I would like to say that I wouldn't have gotten here without my amazing teachers, my moms, and my entire family, and my amazing boyfriend, <laughs> Artie. Um, he has always inspired me no matter what, and especially in my writing, um, which I am very passionate about. And I would like to continue in the future writing stuff like this to help other people. While we're taking a picture, I would like to personally thank Tanya Perche and her leadership and work. She leads a, a team to do this. <laughs> it's very graciously supported by Sheriff Quentin and his office, and we're grateful for that as well. Thank you, Sheriff Miller. Next, we would like to take a moment and tell you about the Battle of the Books. This past couple weeks ago, our elementary schools competed in the Battle of the Books, and Claxton Elementary School won. We have several members of their team here tonight. If you guys would come on up so we could take a quick picture of you with the board. Say, come. Come on. <laughs> Principal Wright. And we have a student who would like to come up and say, say a few words about the process. Hi, my name is Cameron, and I'm going to tell you about the Battle of the Books process. We get like seven to eight books we have to read, and we have to make projects and really understand the book. And then we get quizzed on it, and we have to get enough answers right. Good job, good job, good job. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Wright. Next, we have Hall Fletcher Running Stunning Racers. That is quite the name, Principal Buchanan. Oh, thank you, okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> the Hall Fletcher, Hall Fletcher Elementary School has created a Girls on the Run Club. They meet once a week to learn about healthy living. 
they run at least one mile and have a lot of fun. I think one of our board members actually runs with them sometimes. We have some members here to tell us a little bit about why they love this club. Okay, all right. Well, we'll go applaud them anyway. We also have Asheville Middle School, at least one Asheville Middle School track athlete. If there's any more, could you please come up with me just for a second? Woohoo! Yay, thank you for being here. This is a tough time of year to get students here. We are so proud of our middle school track and field team who, for all of their accomplishments this season, and they were our conference champions. So thank you. Okay. Take just a minute. We'll have a quick picture. Oh, and their coaches are here. Wow, thank you. It's good to see y'all. Take a quick picture with the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Take a quick picture of that team. That is a big middle school soccer team. I'm very impressed with all that. Or track, sorry, track, soccer. I'm, on, I'm hoping I'm sitting good vibes the soccer team. We also want to honor Kelly McCarthy. I know she is here tonight. You can come join us. She has been accepted as the Asheville City Schools Principals Fellows at Western North Carolina University. Yay! We would also like to recognize Craig Schreimer. Even though they're not here, we're going to applaud them anyway. They were recognized. <laughs> Craig will begin their principal fellow internship this fall at IRB Jones Elementary School. Ah, uh, Blair Johnston. Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> you go right there, sorry. Blair Johnson. Asheville Middle School. Prince, assistant Principal Blair Johnson has just graduated from the North Carolina Principals and Assistant Principals Association of Future Ready Leadership Program. Blair. <laughs> Blair, would you like to come up and say a few words about the program? Please. I know that you're not. <laughs> Blair shot, started his assistant principal with me, actually, so be careful what stories you tell. Okay. okay. Um, uh, to the principal fellow, I'm a former principal fellow, so a great journey awaits you. Um, and I guess what I will say is that Asheville City Schools has allowed me to be a principal fellow, supported me in that journey. Um, principal Landreth uh, encouraged me to, to follow through with this future ready leadership. So the encouragement um, and support of Asheville City Schools is why I'm a part of this community. So if anything, thanks to everybody for that. His fabulous haircut is due to um, a pep rally, the first ever outdoor pep rally at Asheville Mill School a few, last week actually. We'd like to take a moment to honor Dr. Mark Dickerson, who I don't see in the room right now. Um, congratulations to our Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Mark Dickerson. He recently completed the North Carolina School Superintendent Association of Aspiring Superintendent Program. So give him a minute. Come on up. I know you're both here. Yay! We had to make a little adjustment so Nancy could be here. I'm so excited. This is perhaps my most favorite part of the school year. Rising ninth graders and the class of 2023's avid students were celebrated for their accomplishment at their end of year celebration banquet. The banquet included these fabulous speakers and we'll let them introduce themselves. And they were also had a speech prepared by uh, Asheville High School or Cecil graduate Erica Howard spoke last week. This year's graduating AVID class is our largest cohort ever. <laughs> For those of you who are new to AVID, AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination and is perhaps one of our most stellar programs. I'm so excited about these kids. Oh, I'll let them go ahead and say a few words. 
All right, hello everyone. My name is Janaya, and I've been in the AVID program since I was in sixth grade. So AVID to me helped me motivate getting my work done uh, because at first it was really hard and challenging to get through high school. Um, AVID also helped me get free um, college applications because they paid for everything and I got awarded the opportunity to get scholarship opportunity before anybody else knew about them. And of course, I have Mr. Hughes to thank for that. <laughs> because of Mr. Hughes, every senior got the opportunity to get help with what they needed, regardless if they had the help at home or had any family members, and Mr. Hughes stepped in to help them. Yes. After high school, I will be attending North Carolina Central University. <laughs> yeah. Eagle Pride! <laughs> I will be getting my degree in criminal justice with a minor in social work. Okay, uh, my name is Nancy, and I'm also graduating this year. And AVID for me has given me a lot of opportunities to be able to uh, apply to college, and not only that, but also gain a community. As you see on our screen, we're all very close friends, and we have been for probably since middle school. And AVID is just something that I don't think I would have gone through high school without because it helped me a lot, especially as a first-generation student. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so the college application process was not easy, especially with a Hispanic mother. Sorry, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I cried at the last speech too, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so AVID is super special to me, and um, with the help of Mr. Hughes and a lot of teachers and my family, I, after I graduate, I'm going to go to Chapel Hill University. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I just want to thank AVID so much. Um, ever since sixth grade, I knew this program was going to help me through a lot. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Yes, 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 please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that completes good news for May. Thank you so much. Thank you, April. Um, I want to say that the next agenda item just continues our good news. And if you wouldn't mind me, um, a moment of um, personal privilege. We met as a board, as a full seven-person board, in uh, January of this year. Um, now here we are, you know, middle of May. With the help of Summit Search Solutions, um, we had 49 can applications for this superintendent position. Um, with, their, with Summit Search Solutions' help, um, we whittled that down to the 16 highest qualified applicants um, working together as a board. We narrowed those 16 down to our nine semifinalists. Um, with Summit, support, Summit Search Solutions support and conversations among the board that were fruitful and deep and engaging, um, we narrowed that down to four finalists. 
and now here we are tonight, so excited um, to be at the threshold of um, being able to make a motion for our preferred candidate, our number one choice for this position. So thank you to the board. Thank you to Summit Search Solutions. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't remind everyone that over the course of months um, of community input sessions, we had over a, a thousand responses to the questions that we asked. Um, and we heard, we heard what the community needed and was, and was asking for. And so we trust that uh, the person you're about to meet that we have, we have heard those voices. So with that, I would um, like to move to this next section of the election of our next superintendent. <clears throat> Mr. Board Chair, with great gratitude for every single student, parent, educator, and staff person who contributed to this process and with utter excitement I move that we elect Dr. Rick Cruz as our next superintendent. Second. It has been <laughs> Sorry, I, I was here for a while. So. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have elected Dr. Rick Cruz as our next superintendent. So as Dr. Cruz comes up to the podium, um, I just want to give you a, a little bit of background. Dr. Cruz comes to us from um, Houston Independent School District uh, as their deputy superintendent. He has, um, uh, Dr. Cruz is an alum of Yale University and also of Teach for America. Um, you might be already saying some of these, so I'll try not to jump on your, um, you know, take, take away what you're saying, but he's been in Houston for 15 years. Uh, in that time, Dr. Cruz has spearheaded equity efforts across the district. His commitment to the children and educators uh, of his district was apparent to us from the first moment that we met him. Um, and the, the tireless efforts he has in bringing community together in support of the schools is really one of the defining things that helped us know that he was the right person for the job. So Dr. Cruz, thank you for being here. We're really excited to start this next ch chapter with you. Thank you. Uh, are the two young ladies that were here that spoke about Avid still in the room? Or, or maybe they stepped away. I, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge and thank them. Can you all hear me? I'm sorry, by the way. Um, is this a little better? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I was saying those two young ladies who spoke a little while ago about their experience in the Avid program and spoke about their teacher, Mr. Hughes. Um, I don't know about you all, but I felt a sudden pang of emotion as they described the community that came together here in Asheville to support them. They talked about their teachers, about their family, their parents that inspired them, and that's what it's all about. And that's why I'm thrilled to be here, extremely grateful to the Board of Education for the opportunity to be here. I can't tell you how excited I am. I'll tell you a little bit about myself in a minute, because I'm sure you all are probably wondering. Uh, but for me, the work is really all about ensuring that we work together as a community, that we are partners in the work, and that we're making sure that every single student in Asheville gets the support, the resources, and the guidance they need to be successful. That for me is equity. That for me is what this work is about. That's what brought me here. So now let me tell you a little bit about what did bring me here. Um, as was shared, I have been in Houston for the past 15 years. I am an educator. I started as a teacher. I was a fifth grade bilingual teacher in Houston um, and really inspired to do that work because of two people very special and important to me that are in this room right now. So I'd like to take a moment actually to acknowledge my mother and my father who are up here, Ruth and Richard, if you can just kind of stand and, and wave. <laughs> And the reason I, I mention them is because my parents came to this country. They brought me as a small, a small child, as an immigrant to this country. And really, education, public education, shaped my trajectory and gave me opportunities that I never even knew existed. 
the incredible teachers that I work with, the counselors that I had, the principals, instilled in me a sense of possibility, coupled with an education that prepared me for so many different types of opportunities. So much so that after it was mentioned, I, I got the chance to go to Yale on a scholarship, and after I graduated, I wanted to do the same thing for others. I wanted to give back, I wanted to inspire others as I had been inspired, and I fundamentally believe that education, public education in particular, is the most powerful resource and asset that we have in this country. And for me, what better way to do that than to serve in education? And I remember I called my dad and my mom and I said, Mom, Dad, I'm graduating from college. I'm going to be a teacher. And my mom was like, ¿Qué, hijo? Uh, right? she, was, she was like, are, are you sure? Like, you, you know, you, you got that fancy education. And, and I said, no, this is, this is what I want. This is, this is what drove me here. This is, these are the values you all gave me and imparted me. And I want to be able to do the same thing. So I started as a teacher in the district, and really near and dear to me was this notion that we have to prepare all students for success. So I worked in, a, in one of our highest uh, poverty schools in the Houston area, and my life changed. As, as cliche as it may sound, the students changed me probably more than I changed them. I knew I'd found my calling. I knew that for me, and this is why I go back to those two ladies who were here earlier today, it was about making sure that we're positioning every one of our students for success in life that we're giving them pathways so they can choose what they want to be, who they want to be, and nothing, regardless of their background, their immigration status, their race, their ethnicity, socioeconomic status, nothing can get in the way of their ability to achieve that. And as a teacher, I got to do that every day. And it was the most amazing thing, the most amazing opportunity that I had. And so much so that I decided I want to go above and beyond. And as a teacher, similar to Mr. Hughes, I worked on helping kids get into college first-generation, low-income, minority kids, and worked with a group of other fellow teachers. We came together and we started helping students go to college and get scholarships to go to college. Because as the young ladies were mentioned, mentioning, sometimes that's a complicated process. Sometimes they don't have people to guide them. Sometimes they're not fortunate to be in programs like AVID that really give those incredible resources and support. So that work got me to, do, uh, to start a nonprofit organization in Houston called Emerge that does that. And we took it from one school and really expanded it quite a bit. It's now a, a pretty large organization working with about 3,500 students across multiple school districts. And really just an incredible opportunity for me to grow and have the impact that I wanted to have. And around 10 years ago, I was asked by the then superintendent to join his leadership team to help kind of oversee the district's broader efforts at preparing kids for college and career. So how are we working starting in pre-K, even before pre-K as we think about family and community engagement? to position our kids so that by the time they walk on that stage, they have options, they have a degree that matters, they can go out and pursue their passions and live the life that they want to live. And I've had the, the, the incredible um, opportunity to do that over the past 10 years in Houston. Houston became my home, it's my community, and I loved it there, my adopted community. Um, but when I heard about the opportunity to come to Asheville, when I was first approached and someone said, hey, Rick, you really need to look into this place. You need to look into this community because it seems to align with all of your values, with your experiences, with your skill sets. And this would be a great place for you to call home and for you to work with the community to do great things for kids. And I started talking to people. I started looking into it. And very quickly, it became apparent that a lot of the values and the things that are happening here in Asheville resonate with who I am and what I want to see in this world. And that became very apparent to me, I'll tell you when. When I came to Asheville and I had the opportunity to interview with this board, I fell in love. Because their language, what they articulated in terms of the vision that they have for the students of Asheville, the desire to build on the excellence that's here, the desire to partner with all of the different stakeholders to do great, th to do great things, and their focus on equity, on again, making sure that we're doing right for every one of our kids resonated with me. And I remember leaving the interview and I called my mom and she said, how did it go? And I said, mom, I've never wanted something as bad as this. Um, and she said, are you sure, son? And I said, yes. I, I just felt this energy and this excitement, which is what I feel today. Coming here, seeing all of the students, seeing the staff, the good news, the, the positive energy in this room is inspiring and something that I look forward to building off of to do even greater things for kids here. 
My commitment to you all is that I will work with you all, I will listen to the community, I will stand side by side with each and every one of you in this room, in the community, in our schools, our teachers, our principals, and provide all of the resources and support so that together we can move this district and make it even better than it already is. So that we can ensure that every one of the students who, on the, uh, who goes on the graduation uh, stage has a story to tell that inspires just like those two young ladies that inspired all of us a little while ago. So again, I just wanna tell you how incredibly humbled I am by this opportunity. I am looking forward to making Asheville my home for the long term. This is a community I've already grown to love. As was mentioned, I was in Houston for 15 years and that's because I value community. I know that this work takes time. It's about relationships, about building trust. It's about figuring out how we work collectively to make things better for kids. And I am really looking forward to being here for a very long time with each and every one of you as we work together towards excellence and equity. So thank you all again. I'm really looking forward to getting to know you all over the next few weeks. Thank you, Dr. Cruz, and, and welcome one more time. Um, you all um, have heard me say this from this place, from also down on the floor during work sessions. If you were a part of our community conversations, you've heard me say it as well. Um, <clears throat> I believe firmly that um, Dr. Cruz, as our superintendent, um, is as successful as we, as a district, allow this district to be. And so uh, I can speak I will speak on behalf of the board now. We will support you, Dr. Cruz, as you come into this role, um, and we will rally this community around supporting you because supporting you means we're supporting our students and we're supporting our educators. So I want to lift that up right now that, that this is a collective effort um, for supporting our school. So thank you, Dr. Cruz, for being a part of that collective effort. And now you get to sit and watch the rest of a board meeting. So. <laughs> so with that, um, we will move on to public comment. What's that? Oh yeah, I do, yes, thank you, Amy. Um, and just a reminder for folks who are in the room, um, after, uh, I see the commissioner is leaving, um, after this board meeting, we are having a light reception in central office um, right after this. So I hope those who are walking away will be able to stay. Are they listening? <laughs> George, yes. can, I, can I just say something really yep. quick? I know all these people are leaving. Um, and Dr. Cruz, you don't know them, these folks that are leaving, but it was a real testament to the importance of this school system to our community that we had county commissioners, the sheriff was right behind you, the, the city manager was here, and these folks are really invested in our school as well, and they were here to celebrate you being here. So you won't get to meet them tonight, but I just wanted to say it's been pretty exciting to look at the crowd tonight and see these folks who are so excited that you're here. Thanks, George. Thank you. So next on the agenda item uh, is public comment. Um, board of Education greatly appreciate your interest in the Asheville City Schools and we welcome your comments to the board. Please be mindful of the following guidelines per policy 2310. Unless otherwise approved by the board, the total time for public comment shall not exceed 30 minutes for in-person and 50 minutes for virtual speakers. Members of the public may speak for three minutes and the time remaining is indicated by lights directly in front of you at the podium. Multiple speakers from a group who are presenting on the same topic may choose to elect one speaker for the group. If a single speaker is used by any group, they shall be allocated five minutes instead of three to address the board. If your group chooses this option, please identify everyone in the group when you sign up to speak and when you're up at the podium. <clears throat> If an unusually large number of people wish to speak, the board may decide to either reduce the time allotted to each speaker or require the designation of a group of spokesperson, um, require the designation of a group spokesperson. Substitute speakers will not be permitted and speakers may not donate any portion of their time to another speaker. Please be respectful. A disruption by any person or persons of a public meeting will not be tolerated and can result in removal from the meeting. Incorrect or misleading information presented by a speaker may be responded to at the discretion of the chairperson. 
Public comment allows you to uh, provide the Board of Education with your thoughts and or relevant information concerning the Asheville City Schools. Therefore, board members will not normally respond to individuals who address the board except to request clarification. In order to make a public comment, individuals must be present and make their comment in person or virtually online. Confidential student and personnel matters may not be discussed during public comment, and the board does not accept personnel complaints through public comment. If you have a concern about an employee or a student matter, please contact or see the superintendent after the meeting, and I will clarify what I mean by that is our interim superintendent, Dr. Cosper. Um, <clears throat> the board permits public comment on issues relevant to and within the jurisdiction of the school district. Although an individual may identify themselves as a candidate for any public office, no person may use the public comment portion of a board meeting to actively campaign for or endorse a specific candidate running for public office. Persons are not limited from speaking on issues relevant to the official business of the school system. For purposes of, the, uh, purposes of this policy, active campaigning includes, but is not limited to, asking for support for a candidate running for public office and or stating what a candidate will do if elected to public office. Uh, so, with that in mind, we will start with our first in-person speaker, um, Sybil Jefferson. Good evening, school board members, Asheville City Schools Foundation, and central office staff, colleagues, and community members. My name is Sybil Jefferson, and I currently work at Asheville High School. Ms. Jefferson, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you mind moving the... I'm short. I'll forget. <laughs> Thank you. I currently work for Asheville High School as the assistant principal for ninth grade. Um, I'm here to say thank you. Thank you once again for educating me by giving me a chance to further my education. Your investment in my education once again uh, through the Asheville City School Foundations means more to me than you'll know. I am a legacy, as are many people in this room. But um, I started Asheville City Schools at Barry Temple L uh, Daycare. It was a low-income daycare right over here off of Town Mountain Road. Um, I later was a latchkey kid from Claxton Elementary School. Yep. <laughs> and I later went to Hill Street Middle School where Martha Geithner sang her little ditty throughout the day as we went down the hallway. I was later at Asheville Junior High as its last year as the junior high. And then I was the first um, freshman class at Asheville High School. I started working for Asheville City Schools in 1998. And I started as an education or an instructional assistant for the special ed department where I found my love for special education and all the things special ed. Um, later, I ended up as the teacher at Asheville Middle School with April Dockery, and um, I am now at Asheville High School, as I said, as the assistant principal. But during the time that I've worked at Asheville High School or Asheville City Schools, I have gotten four degrees. My last degree was I graduated Friday with a master's in school administration. <laughs> I say all this, I say all this, and I tell you all this to say this. It is so important that we have things like Asheville City Schools Foundations to grow our own. We have to grow our own. We are people in this community who have investment in it. We've gone to school here. We've grown up here. Some of the people in this community have raised us, and we are here to stay and we want to be a part of this community. So having scholarships like what the Asheville City Schools Foundation had helped push me in that direction. And I just want to say again, thank you. Next, we have Pastor Ronald Gates.
Well, good evening. I'm Superintendent Ronald Gates. I'm the senior pastor of Greater Works Church of God in Christ here in the city of Asheville, North Carolina. I am also a parent and a taxpayer. There is some explicit books and videos uh, specifically I'm going to be talking about that addresses our elementary schools. Uh, these books are used during story times without the parents' uh, knowledge to undermine the children that have Christian beliefs and faith in God of the Bible. These uh, educators or teachers uh, have, with their endeavor to, with, with endeavor to incite and deceive our children, or more or less with, say, predator or evil intent. For the next few moments, I want to share or address some books that are not in line with the North Carolina general statutes, with sexual explicit graphic and pornographic information. This is specifically in elementary schools. Evil intention, according to Cambridge Dictionary, means morally bad, cruel, or something you want or plan, desire, explicit or inflict injury or harm to another. These evil intentions is to undermine their belief and faith that God made them a boy and a girl. These evil intentions, morally bad, undermines and disrespects the parents. In the video, it begins to share that the parents would not understand that they can be either a boy or a girl when a boy is XY and a girl is XX. And they begin to disrespect or undermine the parent in the midst of the child. Evil intentions to groom or indoctrinate our children. That's with a plan to say that they can be a boy or a girl or can be changed with the endeavor with gender affirming to change them without the parent's consent or even issuing puberty blockers or moving them towards some type of surgery. This is evil intent. I have given you a handout with just a few of the end, uh, elementary schools, but there's so much more. There'll be others talking about the middle schools. It's a sad day. You know, Matthew, 8 and 6 says, for whoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it will be better for them a milestone to be hanged around their neck, Thank that you, they will Reverend, be drowned Reverend Gates, in your, the sea. Thank you, your time. Thank you up. for this Thank opportunity you. to share. I do have, amen, uh, cards for those Reverend who want to know you. what's actually in the school system. Thank you, Reverend Gates. Next up, we have Pastor John, and I'm going to butcher the last name, forgive me. Um, Aman Manchukyu, is that correct? <laughs> Sir, if you, if you wouldn't mind in front of the mic, and you have three minutes. My father gave me a long last name. It's Aman Chukwu. It means I know God. And I'm glad to say that I do. I'm here today to talk about uh, this book here. My name is John Aman Chukwu, as I stated earlier. It's called, It's Perfectly Normal for Students 10 and Up. This book details all kinds of sexual images, pictures of elderly people nude, pictures of an individual who's in a wheelchair with his penis out. All of these sexual pornographic images are made available and placed at the fingertips of children. And I'm sure Dr. Cruz, I don't know if you knew about this before you signed on, but hopefully this is something that you can address and deal with because this is immoral and asinine to allow children to be able to see this. Also, this book even shows images of two women having sex, a man and a woman having sex, and two men having sex. That's not perfectly normal. Who decides what's normal? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? 
Or do parents decide what should be placed at the fingertips and allowed to be taught to their children in the school system? I'll read some of this for you. It says, after a bit, a person's vagina becomes moist and slippery. And the clitoris becomes hard. After a bit, a person's penis, penis becomes erect, stiff, and larger. Pastor. Sometimes a bit of clear Pastor. fluid that may contain a few sperm comes out of the tip of the penis and makes Pastor. it wet. Can we, sir, I'm sorry. I, Is I'm, there, I, did I, was it something I said? <clears throat> was it something I said? If you don't want to hear it in a school board meeting, why should children be able to check it out of the school system? You see, we have perverts that are perverting our kids. And you all sit back smug in your chairs and celebrate diversity, equity, and inclusion, but you don't want me to read it so you can hear it. Why? Does it bother you? Yes or no? You can't answer that question. You want to know why? Because politically speaking, you can't say that it's wrong. You probably are a Christian man. But many Christians today have become more Democrat than Christian. Some Republicans have become more Republican than Christian. I'm not trying to win an election. I don't get my talking points from the RNC or the DNC. I get my talking points from the B-I-B-L-E, from the Bible. And you don't want me to read the filth because it exposes the truth. How dare you tell me to stop reading it? If you don't want to hear it, why should the children have to see it? Pastor, your time is, is, the time is up. Thank you. That makes two of us. Next up, we have Michelle Morrow. In Article 9 of the Constitution, the North Carolina Constitution states that religion, morality, and knowledge are necessary for good government and happiness of mankind. Schools, libraries, and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. In the preamble of that same Constitution, we acknowledge that God is almighty and also the sovereign ruler of our nation. And we need to give thanks to him for the blessings that we have received being citizens in this country. I mention this because... God has a high bar of expectation for anyone that takes on the role of an overseer, of which each of you are. God also demands that adults protect children. He demands that we train them in righteousness. The enemy of us all, the devil, seeks around who he can steal, kill, and destroy. You are not only accountable if you're an elected official in North Carolina. You're not only accountable to the people here in Asheville and to the Constitution of North Carolina. You're also accountable to Almighty God. And as they have stated before, God has severe penalties for people who will harm children or allow others to harm children. Um, as a nurse of 30 years trained at UNC Chapel Hill, <clears throat> There have been decades of research that have been done about the impact of sexual stimulus in the minds of a developing child. Let me just give you a list of what has been proven decades around the world. Anxiety, confusion, it rewires their, their growing brains to mimic the behaviors, causes addiction to sexual stimuli, depression, identity disorder, anger, emotional distress, a loss of academic achievement, questioning gender and sexual orientation, and relationship issues for a lifetime. Our young people are most vulnerable because, to these effects because their frontal lobe is not yet developed until the age of 25. What is the frontal lobe responsible for? For language, judgment, problem solving, impulse control, and social and sexual behavior. When we allow adult themes to be inundating the developing minds, we are causing lasting dam damage. We are robbing them of their innocence, stealing their potential, destroying their relationships, and we are abusing our roles as protectors and educators. The school system should be partnering with families, faith organizations, communities, businesses, and law enforcement to provide the safe, respectful, and caring environment that will allow our children to achieve exactly what God has created them to be. I implore you to please use your 
position to protect our children's innocence, to foster healthy relationships, encourage personal responsibility, and focus our limited instructional time on academics, character development, and career preparedness. Our children shouldn't know what happens in the adult world. Let them have their childhood. And I say, anything less is morally, ethically, academically wrong, and you will be held accountable. If anyone agrees with me, stand up. These are the people that you serve, and more than that, our children Thank need you. to Your be time protected. Is up. Next up is Colleen Miller. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I've been an advocate for public education for years, since the 70s, when I graduated from Pequimans High. My daughter is a product of, pro of public education. However, it's become apparent that schools are ground zero for the sexual and gender identity revolution. I discovered an alarming number of books in your schools in Asheville. They focus on subjects that are not appropriate for minors, just as Michelle said. Let me read from one of these books. And young children really should not be hearing this. I'm your daughter, effing me illegal, but I keep my mouth shut so effing don't turn into a beating. I start to feel goo, coming now, rocking under the curl now, my twat, jumping juicy. It feel good, I feel shamed. He squeezed my nipple, bit down on it. I come some more, so you like it. He pulls his D out, the white cum stuff, pour out my whole hole, wet up the sheets. And there's a lot more in this book. I can't, it will make you sick to read it. If I were to provide this book to a child in my neighborhood, I could be arrested for violating obscenity laws. This book has even been made into an R-rated movie, but it's on shelves in Asheville schools. Yes. It's okay if you want to read these books in your home or you want to provide them for your children, please, that's fine. That's your right. But don't spend good money on books that do nothing to help the development, children develop critical race, thinking skills and improve their education. Stop exposing children to inappropriate materials. Schools are supposed to educate students in a safe environment. What happened to the goal of excellence in education, teaching students the skills they need and values they need to succeed in life? Our students deserve better. Let's improve the literacy rates. Instead of dumbing down children with books that are poorly written, filled with expletives, violence, and illicit drug use, sexual scenarios, and such, I've heard the excuse these books are necessary so every student can find a book that relates to his or her life. That's not the intent of public education. Let's spend money on books that matter, such as textbooks instead of books that do nothing to improve critical thinking and academic performance of readers. Another argument I've heard is the First Amendment. I'm not advocating for banning books. That's nonsense. Schools should provide books that have serious literary, artistic, and scientific value. Unfortunately, many of these books do not meet those expectations. And then there's an ever-increasing number of gender ideology books. These promote gender confusion, even in the earliest grades, as Pastor Gates mentioned. This is driven by a political agenda, and it's evil. It's time for education and policy changes to stop exposing children to inappropriate texts and images. We need a rating system like the Your movie time. industry. Your time is up. Thank you. If you agree Thank with you. me, Your please stand. Up. I mean, if you're okay with this. Your time this, is up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up is Janet Peterson. <clears throat> Ms. Peterson, just a reminder that you do have three minutes. Okay. Congratulations on your new position, Superintendent. You you can see you have your work cut out for you. 
Uh, America has a long history of protecting children through regulation. In 1970, we had the passage of the Poison Prevention Packaging Act. In 1986, the child care safety seat regulations were enacted. In 2019, access to tobacco products were passed. In 1968, the Motion Picture Association of America chose to self-regulate and established a rating system for use by parents to shield their children from inappropriate content. It appears that we need to do the same. Children have access to inappropriate material in our public schools of all places. We're not protecting the innocence of children when we choose inappropriate books for literature study or place on the library shelves, waiting for a trusting child to pick up. Books that introduce children to the confusion of many genders, books illustrating self-harm, cutting, piercing, suicide, rape, molestation, drugs, straight sex, kinky sex, instruction on anal sex, and de depressing stories where characters are left feeling hopeless. We have a problem, and we've talked about that. Michelle talked about depression, self-harm, and suicide are at all-time high among our youth. The Asheville City School's own vision statement says to empower and engage every child to learn, discover, and thrive. What are your students learning in the classroom and discovering on the shelves of the school libraries? The pavementeducationproject.com is currently showing some of the books available to students in media centers in Asheville City Schools. PEP's purpose is not to censor what authors write, just to expose the content that is found within libraries where the primary clientele is minors, not adults. Barely two years ago, Dr. Seuss books were banned at some schools by the same activists that are fighting to keep sexually inappropriate books in libraries now. The board, along with equal representation from across the community, should create a transparent rating scale for purchasing and evaluating books. You can no longer trust that the award-winning books from the ALA on the, or the list are necessarily good reading choices. The board needs to take action by rehousing or removing books that are sexually or developmentally inappropriate for minors. And parents and citizens, you need to challenge these books. You need to see the principles. You thank you. Your, thank you. Your time is up. You thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Next up, we and have John Brigham. You. Good luck, sir. I love being an American. So we're all different, and it, 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 we seem to make it work out somehow. I think, I think actually we do a pretty good job of mixing our, uh, I think we do a pretty good job. I've got three subjects. First subject, let's look at Todd. Now Todd is a preppy white boy. He is in a dysfunctional school district. This is almost like saying he goes to school in the United States. Poor Todd, what's gonna happen to him? You know what? He's going to end up in law school anyway. He's going to get another chance, and then another chance, and then yet another chance. Okay, let's look at Mark Cuevas. Not a preppy white boy, not at all. This young man is in the same dysfunctional school district. What's going to happen to him? He's in danger of being thrown away. He may get another chance, but maybe not. The only path to help Mark Cuevas is to put him in a strong, healthy school system. This is a school with teachers who can do this complex job. This is a school with kids who want to learn. We need kids surrounded by an atmosphere of learning. If a school district wants to help kids of color and kids in poverty, there's no way to do it without strengthening the whole district. Without strengthening the whole, there are programs directed at kids of color. Let's make a new program. We'll call it program number 17 to help kids of color and kids of poverty. These programs will not work and actually become part of the problem. 
Let's quickly look at new subject. Let's quickly look at Congress. They are surrounded by lobbyists. The lobbyists are concerned about taxpayers' rights. They're concerned about efficiency in government. They, well, no, actually, no. They are there to manipulate Congress to their own selfish agendas. The Asheville City Schools School Board. The budget is $87 million. You are big power brokers. You have forces surround you. They are much like lobbyists. Do not trust any of them even for a minute. I've never seen the teachers union at the decision making table. I want to add that I like the way Daniel Winthrow does his job. The parents groups, I wouldn't distrust them exactly, but they don't have much to offer. School districts always have these nonprofits swirling around them. The charities have angles and agendas and there's no reason to assume that they are genuinely interested in education. If they offer you resources, take them. If they put conditions on these gifts, be wary. But John, you're implying that not everybody is interested in public education. That's exactly what I'm implying. And if you can figure that out, you let me know. Okay, third subject, we live in a world of hierarchies. We are all responsible to others and have persons responsible to us. How does the Asheville City Schools School Board fit into this? The Asheville School Board is at the top of the pile, period. There's nobody above you. You are now responsible for a school system that you did not create. The Asheville City Schools needs change. The teachers will be patient, but they need to see change. And if they do not see change, it's your fault, period. And, and, and I want to be, be, offer my sincere thanks. Thank you. Next up is Pepe Acebo. Good evening. Um, well, that was a, a little bit uh, of an unexpected uh, trend in our public comment. Um, normally, we have people who are advocating for resources or thanking the board or thanking the superintendent, um, bringing uh, issues to the attention of our school board and our superintendent. Um, I just want to say, Dr. Cruz, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Pepe Acebo. I was one of the candidates along with uh, a bunch of these folks for school board. And I'm just grateful that the school board has put in the hard work. Um, thank you all for, against my advice, going out and getting a fabulous superintendent. Uh, we have this uh, track record of having absolutely amazing interim superintendents, including Dr. Cosby, and then sometimes not getting a superintendent who will be with us for years. So I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to support your success in the school district and the success of the school district as a whole. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Pepe. <clears throat> Next up, we have Bailey Griffith. Good evening, um, thank you. I am Bailey Griffith and I am a media coordinator at Claxton Elementary. Um, and I am at this meeting tonight to celebrate my Battle of the Books team. Um, and I wanted to just take a second and talk about some things that happen in our school libraries. Um, and Battle of the Books is one of those really awesome things where students get the opportunity to read um, lots of different types of fiction books and study them, learn to discuss those books with their friends, create a project, and then have a competition about the things that happen in those books. And that's just one piece of my job that is absolutely delightful. Um, every day students come in, we talk about what types of books they love to read, um, what they're interested in, we try to find the next best read based on their reading level, what their interests are, what we have in our collection. And I spend a lot of my time talking with my colleagues, other school librarians, about what great books we can add to our collection to get students more interested in reading. Because they can read high above their reading level 
when they have an interest in those books. And I am incredibly proud to do what I do. And um, I'm a professional. I have skills in collection development, in cataloging, in teaching. And I use those every day. And so I just wanted to share a piece of what all school librarians in this district and in this country are doing um, to encourage reading in students. Thank you. Thank you. That wraps up uh, in-person public comment. Um, I believe we have some virtual public comment. Okay. We <clears throat> we had six sign up. We had one show up, but they may have already left. Yeah, they have left. I'm gonna check the other one just to make sure. April is the one that says virtual public comment. Yeah, just making sure the other one wasn't. Oh, okay. Okay. No, we have no virtual public no, no comment. Left. Okay. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have consent items, um, which include um, media, meeting minutes for March, April. Um, we also have student releases to Buncombe County. Our personnel report number nine. Included in consent items are the recommendation, um, the resolution around state PRC 071, the supplemental teacher pay, budget amendments, recommended 2023 school calendar change, uh, and then policy second and final read on those items. Any questions about the consent items? Does the personnel report go on consent or <coughs> do we, did we change that? We moved it to consent just because uh, recognizing uh, this meeting yeah. in particular, yeah, okay. just to kind of try to squeeze it off. If, if we need to move it off, we can make it. Just curious. I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions about it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent items have passed. Uh, and finally, just some uh, announcement of future meetings for this, um, for our community. Um, Memorial Day holiday is Monday, May 29th. No school for students and staff. <laughs> we have our next work and close session. Um, the board does um, Monday, June 5th at 5 p.m. here in the boardroom. A big shout out on June 10th at 7 p.m. at the Asheville High Silsa campus. We have graduation for Asheville High and Silsa seniors. Um, I will be there and very excited for my daughter. Um, <clears throat> our next regular board meeting is Monday, June 15th here in the boardroom at 5 p.m. And then we do have a special called work and closed session board meeting scheduled for Thursday, June 29th. That time is to be decided and um, that will be um, uh, as a response to whatever the Buncombe County Commissioners, um, you know, if we have to make some budget changes. So it is um, scheduled and we'll keep you posted if we need to actually have that meeting. Um, and with that, anything else that, yes? I don't believe that June, June 15th is not a Monday. It's a Thursday. Ah. Monday would be June 12th. Thank you. Appreciate catching that. So yes, uh, the regular board meeting would be Monday, June 12th at 5 p.m. Anything else from the board? Once again, Dr. Cruz, we're excited for you to join us. Um, Dr. Cruz's official first day will be July 1st. Um, so there'll be time to, um, to get him involved and Dr. Cosby will be part of that transition. Um, for those who have um, invited, we'd love for you to join us um, at the close of this meeting um, for a light reception on the other side of the central office building. And with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second.